Well, hello, everyone. First Baptist Church Hebron, we're so glad you're here today. All of you watching online and all of our visitors, we're glad to have you. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that everyone has struggled with is keeping the right attitude. All it takes to trigger the wrong attitude is someone to say the wrong words or the right words in the wrong tone or maybe no words at all in just our body language. Well, it really doesn't take much to rub us the wrong way and get us off track. Having the right attitude opens up opportunities for God to work through us by his spirit. If we desire to be an effective tool that God can use, having the right attitude is extremely important. As we learn today about having the right attitude, let's keep in mind the words of Paul in Ephesians 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come together today this morning, I pray that our desire would be to bring you glory and to love your presence in our lives. If we are going to have, be a light in this world and be your ministers of reconciliation, we must have the right attitude. Help us to show humility, patience, and love towards one another, and never let us forget the mercy and forgiveness you gave to us. Prepare our hearts to receive your word today, and let us begin by praising you with a joyful noise in Jesus' name. Now, if you'd like to all stand as we begin to worship. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For oh, my pardon, this I see. But the blood of Jesus for oh, my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain. But the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Jesus Not of good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me White as snow, no other bound I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the 
Question, where can you go safely in this world below if you have Jesus? Pastor? Anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> So uh, y'all can be seated, as you already have. Um, so as Sean told us already, uh, Pastor Steve today is talking about attitude. And uh, I was thinking about what songs would fit the theme of attitude. You know, honestly, um, I think it's a, uh, it's a kind of unfortunate thing about worship music. There are some topics that do just don't get covered well enough people haven't written songs about them because they're kind of uncomfortable like change my attitude how many songs do you really hear about you know what I'm the problem change me like we've got too much ego I think to uh, 
to make too many songs about that. But this song in particular uh, cuts me right to the heart and it, hopefully it will for you too. It's called Called Me Higher. And uh, it's about how you can have an attitude of, you know, it, you can have an attitude where you're open and receptive to Jesus. You, you want him to be present in your life, but you don't do anything about it. And honestly, like, it's good to be open and receptive to, receptive to Jesus. So it's good to be, you know, uh, like, calling on his name, uh, asking for salvation from him and everything. But, like, if you don't ever actually let him work in you and work through you, James says, you know, faith without works is dead. Like, what, what are you doing in your spiritual life? And this song is about being in that position of... Uh, just sitting there and not doing anything with your faith and not allowing it to to flow through you and reach other people in your life um and how that like for for all the the good that that actually does because it does do good in you but for all the good that, that actually does jesus has called us to a higher purpose he has called us to the great commission to go forth and baptize all nations in his name I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe, oh, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave, oh, never let these walls down. But you have called me higher, you have called me deeper and I'll go where you me higher you have called me deeper and I'll go where you I 
will be your soul. I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy. I will be yours, Lord. I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy light the path before me. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go
was awesome. Wasn't that good? Yes. Go ahead and clap again if you want. I mean, <laughs> incredible, outstanding musicians. Thank you guys. That was really wonderful. I, I love those first two songs. I was down here saying, uh, get down, get funky, amen. Uh, It's funny watching old people move, isn't it? Did you look around? Some of you, you know, you, it's, it's kind of like it's still there, but you only can get it going one way. <laughs> Anybody else have that problem? I can go left. I, I can't go right anymore. But I got a good attitude about it. You know, you just keep going. But I tell you who can move is Gingy. I don't know if you caught Gingy. Man, she, was, she had it going on. So that was awesome, incredible. Great uh, message in, in music and worship. That's a, it's an awesome way to start, especially when you're talking about your attitude. Now, as quickly as I say that, I'm sure there's somebody in the room who didn't like that because they got a bad attitude, right? It happens. You can't get everybody on the same page with attitude. It just, just can't happen because our attitudes are... And, you know, there's so many ways that they change, and they change so often, as David was talking about. You know, it just kind of if you're not on guard, you know, your attitude will get bad. And, uh, and if there's not anybody there to correct it, it'll stay bad. I remember I was 14 years old. I was playing on the Compton Comets. It was, uh, it was an elite baseball team. And they were all mostly 15 and 16, and we were good. We beat everybody. We just traveled around. And, and beat everybody. And, and I was on the team at 14, and I was on the team because I was great. I can say that now because there's no way anybody can check. <laughs> there's no video. There's nothing left. You know, it's all gone. Uh, and, but, uh, but I could hit, and I could hit because I didn't swing at it if it wasn't a strike. I had a tremendous command of the strike zone. So imagine my shock when I'm at the plate and I'm standing there and that umpire calls a pitch that's definitely in my eye, strike one. And then later in the count, I think it was two and one, he decided to call another pitch that was obviously a foot outside. And we got to three and two. And I remember this vividly because of what happened next. He called strike three on a pitch that was in the dirt. And, uh, and my attitude went off. I remember the first thing I did was turn around and look at him and scream, What? What is wrong with you? And I took my helmet off and pitched it as high as I could get it up on that screen. And I'm walking away. I get about three steps away. I turn around. I take my bat. I throw my bat up against the fence. I take one step toward that umpire. And a gorilla grabs me on the nap of the neck on the seat of the pants, and before I know it, I am outside the ballpark in my mother's car. <laughs> Eleanor came and got me, took me off the I'm, I don't think I ever touched the ground. I don't know what kind of super strength she found, but I was in the car, and she just looked at me, and she said, it is not going to happen. You will not play baseball ever again with that attitude. And baseball was my life. I mean, I, it was all I thought about. It was all I was interested in. 
My schoolwork showed it. And, and I, I, remember, I remember going back and apologizing and begging my mom to let me play. And she said, okay, but never again. Do you understand? Never, ever again. And the rest of my career, when an umpire did an awful thing, because he did it wrong, and I was right, I found the ability to take my helmet off, lay it on the ground, lay my bat down, and walk away. And, and that was my routine. Of course, I didn't have to use that very much because I barely ever struck out. Yeah, no footage at all. It is on record, though, struck out one time in high school, four-year career. Uh, and it was a bad call. So <laughs> see how your attitude can affect you over a long period of time? It's, things just stay with you about your attitude. I was looking at some, uh, some important matters about attitude from some different people. Listen to Winston Churchill. Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Isn't that true? And then my favorite, my friend uh, for, for the longest time, Zig Ziglar, great honor of my life to know Zig and to know him well. And, uh, and I love his quote. I've always loved this quote of his. And Zig would say it this way, your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. And I heard that a thousand times, and it made sense every time. It doesn't matter how bright you are, how uh, energetic you are, how, how uh, unbelievably charismatic you are. None of that matters if your attitude is wrong. If your attitude is bad, and I, I love this by Henry Ford, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Think about that. And then, uh, and then Tozar said it this way, attitude toward things in the long run is to be more important than the things themselves. See, we get caught up. We get obsessive. We perseverate over things. It's a big word. Hmm? It makes me feel like I'm erudite. <laughs> Another big word. Well read and learned. I stole both those words. Perseverate means you just work it over and over and over in your head because your attitude went bad. The single uh, most important thing that you will do day by day that will determine the decisions you make that will guide your direction is your choice of your attitude. It is also the last real freedom that we have as an individual. doesn't matter what happens in our world politically. It doesn't matter what goes on in any way in the world. We still get to choose. The one thing that we can choose is our attitude. And that's still a freedom to us and always will be a freedom. Your life is divided up into about 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you feel about it. And there are people that go on for years and years and years and never let something go. And it creates a problem with their attitude, an ongoing problem. And then Something new happens, but it's not really new. They just tag it on to what it is that they already have a bad attitude about. We hear it all the time about churches. I'll never go to another church because that, that, that one church hurt me. That one pastor was, was mean to me. I didn't like that church, so I'm, not go I'm never going to do church again because you got an attitude. Something significantly happened to you. So there's a simple, most important choice. Listen to the definition of what attitude is. It is a mental condition related to a fact or a state. It is a feeling or an emotion toward a fact or a state. A disposition, a feeling, a mood, a, pers uh, a, perspect a perspective, or a sentiment regarding something in your life. Attitude is a mental, emotional thing, and your, your attitude is, is more important. 
Your attitude is more important than your past. It's more important than your successes or your failures. It's more important than your fame or your fortune. It's more important than the education you have. It's more important than your position or your salary. It's more important than your family. It's more important because it's the position you take in your mind. It is, had, it is what guides your life. And as, as you heard Sean say, uh, she read from the Apostle Paul from chapter 4 and, and, and found, you know, our mindset is to be set on God, set on Christ, set on the things above. See, attitude is above everything that happens to you. So how much time, how much effort have we wasted in our lives with the wrong attitude? If we only knew to take on the attitude of Christ, how much full of joy might we be? How much better equipped might, be, might we be to love each other, really, the way we should? You know, if we never make the effort, we'll never know. We just sang a, a great song there at the end, uh, written by Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby uh, died at age 92. She's probably the most prolific hymn uh, writer of all time. She was just absolutely incredible. I think she died in the 90s. But uh, Fanny Crosby, when eight years old, uh, had a, a poultice, a, a medicine put on her eyes that was supposed to clear her eyes up as a small child. Uh, she couldn't see well and, and was considered blind, but they thought what they were going to put on the eyes would fix it. And there was a misapplication of that which rendered her blind for her entire life. So really, she never saw a thing. But listen to, she wrote this at age eight. Oh, what a happy soul am I. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world content I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. So she writes instead, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of, of love. I've gone too far because I'm not going to remember the rest of the words. <laughs> How's it go, David? Born of... Yeah. Purchase of God. Well, it's good. You just heard it. <laughs> Look it up in the hymn book. It's in there. Uh, but just amazing words. See, she understood the formation of her life was going to be counted uh, in, in what Paul says in Philippians 4.8, in the forming of your attitude. Uh, he talks about a bad attitude, and then he goes on and says, these are the things you ought to think about. And he gives us a list, and it's six things. You know, you want to correct your attitude. If you realize I got an attitude problem over many things in my life, and you want to correct it, read uh, Philippians 4.8. He said, think on these things whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think on these things. Instead of thinking of the things you think about and how negative things are in your world and how poorly your circumstances are going, and be, instead of blaming people, think on these things. And you know what will happen? The power of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will be a part of who you are. But part of the problem with attitude is we want to blame people for what's gone on. And it doesn't make any sense. It's not even logical. Have you ever been all angry at somebody who, who just passed you on the freeway and just stayed angry with them like all day, like emotionally hot all day? Did you ever try to chase them down? See, I'm guilty of all this. Did you ever try to, you know, get up next to them and tell them something they don't care? It happens. But here's the thing. You can't blame life on your circumstances. Matter of fact, your circumstances are just your circumstances. And you want to blame life for it. 
Let me, let me give you an example. This is a perfectly good piano, right? Beautiful piano. Now, and we've just heard it played masterful, masterful, real good. <laughs> By Ben. I mean, like, incredibly good. Ben, you are, woo, gifted. And, of course, we hear it every Sunday from Dottie. She sits down, pounds out those notes, makes it beautiful. Ben sits down, makes it magical. But you know, if I walked around there and sat down at the piano and started to play you something, you'd get a bad attitude and you'd say, there's something wrong with that piano. We need to get another piano. That piano sounds awful. We need to get rid of that one and go get it. No, it's not the piano's fault. It's whoever's sitting at the piano. You want me to show you? I think you get the idea. No, no need. I could go over to John's guitar. You want me to go that direction? See, it's not the equipment. It's not the circumstance. It's what's in you. It's Christ in you. It's the Holy Spirit of God. You have the resident character and nature of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and that alone ought to change your attitude for a lifetime. And yet, we still find ourselves in kind of crazy, worked up, nasty attitudes, blaming everybody for everything that goes on. The result of that is a bad attitude. In Mark 7, uh, Jesus talks about a bad attitude. And uh, this, this is an incident where the Pharisees are there and they want to know why Jesus doesn't wash his hands. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't wash his hands before he eats. It means that he doesn't ceremoniously wash his hands. If you were a Pharisee, that was a whole gig. I mean, it, you know, you had a towel and you had to, the way you had to do it. The hands had to go a certain way and it had to be washed over and over. And, you know, none of those boys are going to get COVID. Because they, you know, they, they would cleanse themselves over and over and over before they would eat. And, uh, and, and Jesus and the guys would, you know, basically get a wet one, wipe their hands off and eat. And so they, they were being criticized. They say, why do your disciples defile themselves? And in this little portion of scripture, they say defile about five times. But look at what Jesus says. And uh, after telling them, don't listen to those guys, that's, that's all their problem. He says, he says, then he added, it is what comes from the inside that defiles you. There's nothing on the outside, not a circumstance, not a purpose, not anything in life that you can make up or think about that defiles you. What defiles you which is an interesting word, for, uh, for from within, out of the person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And all of these vile things come from within. And they are what defiles you. There's a lot of ugly, right? There's a bunch of ugly in the world. And none of it has the power to defile you unless your attitude allows it to do such. And then what comes out of you is the same thing. It's defilement. I always love the illustration. Donna reminded me of it this week when I heard her say it again to somebody. Uh, it, you know, it's a Chuck Swindoll. And he says, you know, you get the brand new... You know, you get the brand new white gloves that you put on to go out and go into the garden. You know, those white cotton gloves you buy and you go out in the garden. And the question was, do the gloves get muddy or does the ground get glovey? No, the gloves get muddy. You get out there in the midst of it and now you have a situation. Well, where I want to take you for a good attitude, I want to take you to a great story. You remember this story. The story, uh, you'll remember it, especially if you were a child and you were in church. It's the story about the four men that bring a fifth man on a pallet and they open the roof up and lower him down to be healed by Jesus. You remember pictures of that in Sunday school? That, that they, they would bring 
those pictures that you would unfold and they'd put them up in the classroom and they always had those big folds remaining in them, even though they were cool pictures. Um, you know, we, uh, I remember working with a guy named Bev Sullivan, sweetest person anybody could ever want to meet. And, uh, he, you know, he was, he was leaving, uh, from where we were at to go to another ministry and he was so tender-hearted, we bought him a series of all those Sunday school pictures. Found it online somehow, you know. You know, the, and Jesus walking on the water, you know, and Moses, you know, crossing the sea. All those things you saw in Sunday school growing up. And he wept openly. And I thought, here we gave him something that we were going to giggle about and were jaded about. And for him, it was a precious, precious gift. But you remember that picture. Um... And, and, and so you, you remember uh, what it looked like. Here it is in verses uh, uh, 1 through 4 of chapter 2 of Mark. It says, When Jesus turned to Caper- returned to Capernaum several days later, the, the, news, the news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon, the house where he was staying was packed with visitors, and there was was no room, even outside the door, while he was preaching God's word to them. So, you get the picture that he's in Capernaum, and he's in a house, and people have heard that he's there, and so everybody has flooded the house. So the house is full on the inside, and it's full on the outside. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you love for that to be the story today in churches in America? You know, when we, when we think about churches in America and you look at what it looks like in, in, in today's world compared to, to what it ought to look like, people ought to be hanging out the windows. We ought to have to open the windows. for It ought to be packed. And where it is, you just praise the Lord that that's happening. But here, here he is. He's in this house. Everybody's around the house. Now, you need to know about construction back in those days they would build their house and they would try to get it kind of up on a hill kind of up next to a hill zero lot line on the back if you will because if they could get it up next to a hill they could have the ground that was on the hill come like right over the top and that would form a roof and so they would take what what amounts to kind of a mixture of straw and grass and whatever they could find, and they would, they would build a shingle, and that shingle would go on top of the house. And as it would dry, it would get really crusty. And the top of your house was a place where you would go and, you know, look at the stars and hang out at night and uh, in those hot summer nights. But if you had it kind of wedged up against a, a, a mountain or wedged up against a hill, then you were going to be better off in terms of how it was going to cool and how it would stay warm and all of that. So that's what I picture here. I picture that this house was, was built like that. And so the, all the people were out front. They were out the front door and kind of along the sides. And there would have been stairs that would go up to the top and you could get up to the top where the roof was. But nobody would have been on the stairs because once you get up and behind, you can't you wouldn't be able to hear Jesus. You wouldn't be able to see Jesus. And so that was their only route. I love these guys' attitude. They get there, the place is packed. I wonder which one of them was the first to say, all right, I got an idea. I got an idea. We can go tear that roof up and let him down the roof. And they must have had some pre-planning. Somebody must have had a great attitude from the beginning because they had rope. And they had some sort of tool. They just couldn't tear that roof off with their hands. They, they had a makeshift shovel or something that they pounded away until they were able to get part of that roof peeled away. And I love, I love that picture when you see the picture. The guys are looking down, you know, because they've lowered him down in the midst of Jesus. But can you just imagine you're sitting in this room, and all of a sudden a dirt clot or two are kind of coming down and hitting the ground, and you're kind of looking around, and... And pretty soon, here comes this figure coming down. And maybe it bumps you, you know, on the way over toward Jesus. You know, you back up a little bit. Anyway, they lay this guy down right in front of Jesus. And so, there he is. And it says, and while he was preaching, 
God's, God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. And they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. And so they dug a hole in the roof and threw the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. That's incredible. Have you, uh, have you ever thought about what that must have been like to be in the presence of Jesus and, you know, even to hear his voice? There's some people in your life that their voice means something very special to you. You know, you, you remember their voice. You know, uh, f- for the longest time, I, I kept all the, you know, all the voicemails on my phone from my mom. And I, I remember being broken hearted when I realized they had to go away when I had to change phones. But uh, you still have a memory of those voices that really mean something to you. Maybe you got somebody in your life right now that just helps you just based on the tone of their voice, the way they say things, that it's like a breath of fresh air. You know it's not a breath of fresh air for me. It happened to me the other day. Um, somebody looked at me, and this is kind of a new Christian thing, and pardon me if you do this, but if you do, do this, my attitude would be don't. Um, but you know, the person looked at me and said, can I, I need to speak something into your life. And I went, what? Well, you know, God's told me I, to speak something into your life. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? God told you to tell me something? Tell it. What does it mean? What do you, what do you think you're gaining by saying, I'm going to speak it into your life? Now I realize that's my problem. That's my attitude. Just showed a little bad attitude right there. Uh, but I kind of looked at the guy and I said, why don't you just tell me whatever it is? And uh, <laughs> that came about in a phone call. You know, I was, I was on this Zoom call with a bunch of pastors. And, uh, and they were talking about, at the time, they said, uh, now, are you, guys, are you guys forming an inclusion uh, statement for your church? And on the Zoom call, they wanted to work on an inclusion statement. And some of them were reading their inclusion statements. Because, you know, you can't do business now without an inclusion statement. You can't be a nonprofit. You can't be a small business. You can't be anybody without an inclusion problem. You all know what an inclusion problem is? It's one of, them, it's one of the woke things. You've got to say, how, you know, in real important words, how you're going to include people. And how sorry you are for times when you didn't include people. And how open you now are and you'll include any people. But you got to do it cool and it's got to sound right. And so we're talking about this. And and I guess it's because I I realized I'm the grumpy old man on the call. So finally I said, you know, when they ask me, are are you working on an inclusion statement? I said, no. Are you going to? No. Why not? Don't need to. What do you mean you don't need to? We're all going to do this. Why? Why would you do that? Well, why wouldn't you do it? I said, because the Word of God itself, the gospel, is an inclusion statement. Why would you try to write something less than God's truth as an inclusion statement? You read the Word of God, and it says, you know, Come, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It says, I would that no one would be lost, but all would come to the glory of God. All would be saved. I mean, there is no greater inclusion statement on the face of the earth, and not any of you yahoos can write one. <laughs> and if you write one, I don't want to borrow it, okay? I got my inclusion statement. And so... One of the guys on the call said, Brother, I, I believe I need to speak something into you. <laughs> Can I speak something into you? And I said, Thank you for asking for permission. No, you may not. 
whatever you're about to speak, I'm not interested in. And, and, and his, what he, he, but he went ahead and spoke it into me, and, and I listened to it, and uh, had a bad attitude. So the, the idea is now this man is laying in front of Jesus, and Jesus was speaking, and just his voice. Now, if Jesus ever said to me, can I speak something into, yes, yes, sir, I'm ready to hear it. Well, look at the reaction of the group, because that'll catch your attention. You're in the middle of a Bible study. It, there creates a big hole in the roof. If that were to happen today, <laughs> we, we lose the chandelier. I guess miracles could happen again. <laughs> anyway, I digress for a real purpose. Um, but in Mark 2, 5 through 9, look at what it says. Seeing their faith. What did he see when he said seeing their faith? What does that mean? Seeing their attitude. Man, you guys got a great attitude. A great attitude. You know... An attitude will get you through where aptitude won't. And these guys never gave up. There was a perseverance in them that Jesus calls faith. And when you realize one of the things that faith is, it's a persevering thought that you have from God that you continue in. And, and so he, 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 says, he says, seeing Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, I, I want to stop there and say, well, why did he start with your sins are forgiven? You know, back in that time, when you think about that time, they would ascribe that a person has a handicap. Like if you were born a Down syndrome child, if you were born handicapped in any way, if you weren't whole when you came out of the womb, then the scribes and Pharisees would want to discuss who sinned. You or your parents. They had this theology that you could sin while in the womb. And if you sin badly while you're in the womb, you would come out and you would have a malady of some sort. You wouldn't be perfect. So any kind of difference, they would say that person has sin. And for their whole lives, they would have to live with this shameful thought that while they were in the womb of their mother, they sinned. And because they sinned, God did this to them. And you think, I mean, why would anybody come up with that? What kind of ignorant thought would think that that was decent kind of logic? They did. They did. And so the first thing Jesus does, knowing that all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God, Jesus forgives the guy's sin. That was a very controversial thing for him to do because of who was watching. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now look, at what, look at what happens next. It says, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, and so he asked them. Are, are you aware that you're not that good of a poker player when it comes to your attitude? That your attitude shows. Now certainly Jesus knew their heart. Jesus knew what they were all about. And he forgave the man's sin because he wanted to pull them out of their attitude. And so he realizes, and, and they're in the first stage. This is very early in his ministry because this is the first stage. Anytime they thought they would find someone who might be a Messiah, one of the things that they would do is they would follow him around without asking questions. They would just observe and then later go talk to each other about it. But here, Jesus puts them on the spot because he says, why, uh, you know, why do you question this in your hearts? And they hadn't said anything out loud. He read their face. He read their face, and, and he knew exactly what they were thinking. And, and it, it, was, uh, it was easier to, 
Is it easier to say to the paralytic man, your sins are forgiven, or stand and pick up your mat and walk? He gives them a problem. He said, I know you're reasoning in your hearts that only God can forgive sin. But is it easier for, for me just to forgive their sin, or would it be easier for me to tell the man to stand up and walk? In their minds, both of those are, are improbable. No man can do that. In their minds, they hated Jesus to that point that they didn't understand what was going on. They reasoned in their hearts. And, and so this handicapped man suffering his entire life, laying on this mat, and he might have been a man that had some sort of wealth. These might have been people that worked for him. I think not. I think it's more just friends who took pity on him. He's paralyzed, so it may have been from a fall. It may have been some sort of accident. And, and as he made his way through the accident, he now had friends who were caring for him and trying to figure out how can we get his situation changed. So in Mark 10 through 12, it says, So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man who's just sitting there now, laying there with his sins forgiven, wondering what the heck's going on, smiling up at his buddies, everybody hanging on every word that Jesus is saying. And he says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Three commands. Get up, pick your mat up, and walk out of here. And so when it happens, <laughs> and, and the man jumped up, he grabbed his mat, and he walked out through the stunned onlookers. And they were amazed, and they praised God. They, they uh, e e explaining, we've never seen anything like this before. There it was. That was a shocking thing that happened that changed his attitude immediately. Who knows how he was thinking before this, but he got these three commands from Jesus. Command one was to stand up, pick up your mat, and walk out. And I, I think the guy, it says he jumped up. It says he leaped to his feet, which I find really interesting. Because now when I sit down... And somebody says, get up. There's no jumping up. I used to be able to jump up. You know, I mean, some, you hear some blood-curdling thing happen, so you got to jump up and check it out. No, not so much. If I'm laying down, I, I, I've been taught how to roll now. You know, used to you just spin out and go. You jump. Nope, you roll now. And, and, you know, you, you, and, you, and you make sure you're, make sure you're not dizzy before you leave, you know. So, so you have all that going on, but this guy, he was so excited, been on that bed, probably all kinds of atrophy to his muscle. God did, just didn't get him up. God completely healed his body. He was a strong man again. And so he leaped up, he grabbed his thing, and he, and he took out the door, and the people looked at it, and they were absolutely astonished. In Matthew, when they tell this story, it says they were filled with awe. Dr. Luke says uh, they were seized with astonishment and filled with fear. Good kind of fear. We are in the presence of God kind of fear. It's your attitude that will determine what happens in your life. No one can... No one can physically change your attitude for you. It belongs to you. And it is your attitude that will determine what, what, uh, how you live your life. You might live your life with an attitude that is sour. You might live with an attitude that is bitter, skeptical. You might live an attitude that wants to stay away from God because you think a good God can't do certain things that you see happening in the world. There is, it has everything to do with your attitude. Sometimes when there's a striking event, it confronts your attitude. 
And this striking event confronted the attitude of everybody who saw it. The difference was most of the people were rejoicing. Couldn't believe what had just happened. But some others, even though their attitude should have changed based on the work of Christ, they remained skeptical. They still wanted to kill him. They still wanted to call this something that only God can do, and they wanted to completely ignore that he was the Messiah. It's, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense when you really look at it and how it changes your attitude. You know, this week, um, this past week was a week of celebration for children that were autistic. And I got to thinking about attitude. And... Uh, Many of you might remember Coach Gene Stallings. Coached for Alabama University for years and then came to be a coach uh, with Tom Landry. You remember those old cowboys? You know, back when they were great. They weren't just great on the field, they were great in character. They, uh, Tom Landry had the most pristine character of probably anybody who ever stood on the sidelines all the way to this date. Incredible man. And, uh, and Gene Stallings became a part of, his, uh, part of his team. You may or may not know that Gene Stallings and his wife had a child. And the child was Down syndrome. His name was John Mark. And John Mark would later become the poster child for Down syndrome. And he made a lot of commercials where he'd get on there and he would smile and he would explain what autism was, but I was at a dinner, and Gene Stallings was the keynote speaker, and, uh, and, and I remember he told a story about Johnny. They were going to the Pro Bowl. Now, when you go to the Pro Bowl, all the guys bring their kids. They, you know, this is not a big deal. It's the Pro Bowl. We're going to be, we're going to go out into the Pro Bowl, and, and we'll have some fun. We'll play a football game, but nobody's really going to get hurt. We're going to be careful. And so all the guys would bring their kids. It's over in Hawaii, and they all have fun. And Gene thought, you know what? I'm going to take John Mark. I'm never taking him to one of these things, and I realize that's my attitude. I'm not taking him because he's Down syndrome, and he's a lot of work. But I'm taking him. And so he takes him, and they're there, and, and he's getting ready to go down and, and, and get, get to the field. And, and the wife said, why don't you take Johnny to meet Tom Landry, which Johnny thought was just a great idea. So for hours and hours and hours, Coach Stalling looked at him and said, okay, Johnny. He said, pretend I'm Coach Landry. And he said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to walk up. I'm going to put my hand out. And I say, hello, Coach Landry. Hello, Coach Landry. I'm John Mark Stallings. That's right. That's exactly what you're going to do. They practiced it over and over and over, hundreds of times. And they got ready for the moment. And Gene Stallings said, all through the parking lot, okay, hello, Coach Landry, I'm John, I'm, I'm John Mark. Hello, Coach Landry, I'm John Mark. So good to meet you. Hello, Coach Landry. You know, and so he walks in, and, and they just get inside. He sees Coach Landry. And he runs at him, and he dive bombs at him, and Coach Landry catches him, and he says, Hi, Tom, I'm Johnny. <laughs> and from then on, they were greatest friends. And I can tell you this, because I did have the privilege of meeting Tom Landry. Even his wife called him Coach. Nobody called him Tom, except one guy. One guy, Johnny, John Mark Stallings. You see, sometimes it takes something like that to shock you, something in your life that happens, and, and then it doesn't become something that defeats you, but it gives you a great attitude. I can tell you that the Stallings had a wonderful, wonderful family because they had a great attitude, the right attitude. They had God's attitude. So, I'm going to give you a couple attitude adjustment ideas, because all of us, I like that attitude adjustment, because we are constantly changing, it's constantly 
something we are struggling with is what our attitude is doing to us and what it, how it's changing our faith when it shouldn't. But an attitude can be powerful. Powerful. An attitude can, tain, can, can change the direction of a nation. I just cite for you Ukraine. The attitude of their president has changed the heart of that nation. And in the worst of times, they're making the best of efforts. So the, here's the, the attitude adjustment thing. Evaluate openly and honestly your inner life. Take inventory on a regular basis of your inner life, how you're thinking. All those things you don't say, but you think. Think about what you're thinking. That's pretty frightening. Every once in a while I find myself thinking something and I'm like, whoa, glad I didn't say that one out loud. But critically evaluate against what the Word of God tells you, against what you know, against whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, honorable, right. All of those things, think up against that. What does that look like in my head? You've got to get out of your head, and you've got to get it into your heart. So that's the first thing. Second thing, phone a friend. Phone a friend and ask him for an honest Fair evaluation of who you are and your attitude. And open the door. Please, dear friend, it is better, according to, according to Psalms, it is better to be bruised by your friend than kissed by your enemy. You call a friend, and the friend might say, yeah, you know, I'm catching a little arrogance from you. Just tell you the truth. Really, what's that look like? Why am, I, you know, why am I giving off that vibe? What are you seeing? What can I change? How can I make that godly? How can I make that right? Then the last one is be confident in God. The confidence that God can give you can change the direction of your life. Last week, a Boeing 737 crashed in China. It went kind of unnoticed because the rest of the news... Airplane crashes in China, 137 people die. They were headed to cities that we can't even pronounce the names. It's just kind of a blip in the news. Um, but just imagine if it happened the next day. And then it happened the day after that. Even though it's over in China. And the day after that and the day after that. What if planes just began to fall out of the air? Now, what if, what if two planes a day began to fall out of the air, killing everybody on board? A 737 carries 200 people. And so what if it all happening, and what if it started happening here in America? Well, first of all, we'd quit flying 737s. But just imagine with me if every day for an entire year, three full airplanes just fell to the ground in the continental United States, and everybody died. You'd have a big number by the end of the year. You'd have 158,000 by the end of the year. 600 people dying every day. In America, I tell you that to make this illustration. In America today, doctors are calling a new kind of phenomenon. It's called death of despair. They're even putting it on death certificates. This was a death of despair. And every year, 158,000 people, which are figures that, that rival COVID, and yet nobody talks about it. Nobody has ever spoken really about this. We, we, we don't have any Fauci guiding us to the vaccine on this one. No one is screaming at you and telling you you got to put a mask on to avoid this one. This one is a death of despair. And, and it's, it's suicide. It comes from suicide, drug abuse, and alcohol-related liver disease. All noted. All noted as deaths of despair. And you're like, you're going to end like that? No. That's the symptom. 
The problem is the attitude. The problem is the attitude of a person whose self-worth got to the point that they believed that only suicide could settle their soul. The problem is that a drug addict begins to love the drug more than he loves anything else, even his life. The problem is an alcoholic gets caught in the vortex of that and can't figure out how to get away from that, how to get dry and live a normal, happy life. And it won't change unless an attitude changes. And guess what? We don't have to figure out what the vaccine is. Nobody has to go start trying to make it up in a lab somewhere. We have the vaccine. The vaccine is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The vaccine is the hope that we have in Christ. The vaccine is leading somebody to Christ who is lost, who can't handle these issues in their life because they have no power without the power of God. The problem is we have the vaccine. And we're not delivering the vaccine to a lost world. So day after day after day, they disappear in deaths of despair. Don't make any of these a chronic part of your attitude. That's why it's so important that we check our attitude every day. Check in with the Lord God. Recognize that he has given us what all he has given us. And recognize the glory that we have in him. I saw a wonderful man on, on, on Facebook. He pulled up with his truck and he got out of his truck and uh, he was going to gas and so he showed the gas and how much the gas was. It's over four dollars and he's getting over here, he's putting it in his tank and he's starting to give real criticism toward what's going on in our world and he was going to criticize the president and it was like watching him and then boom, right in mid-sentence he stopped. And he hesitated and he said, Okay, Lord. And then he looked back into his little camera and he said, You know, the Lord just reminded me that there was a time when I didn't have a truck. There was a time in my life when, when I didn't have any money to put gas into anything and I didn't have anything to put gas in. And God just reminded me of that. And I wanted to tell you all how awful it is, but now I don't. I want to tell you how great God is and how he can come in and he can revolutionize your life. And he gave a great testimony for Christ. And I'm, I'm watching, I'm thinking, now that is awesome. And then he turned around with a little boyish grin and said, but I think gas is still too high. <laughs> it might be. Find the attitude of Philippians 4, 8. He would also say in Philippians, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ. Father, help us. Help us with our attitude. Help us to find the fact that a winning attitude is faith in Christ. Help us have the attitude that these four men had, an attitude of perseverance, an attitude of getting their friend healing Father, give us a burden for our friends. Give us a burden for people who don't know how to get out of the attitude structure they in. They, they, they don't know Christ as their personal Savior. And Father, I pray if anybody is listening here or online and they recognize I have no power to change my attitude, I pray by the Spirit of God you would save them. You would enter into their hearts and they would give all that they know about you to all that they give all they know about themselves to all that they know about you and come to faith in Christ. Father, help us. Help us to enjoy the loveliness, the treasure of you, the glory of you as you guide us. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And David's going to sing... Uh,
beautiful, reflective song. And while he does, I want you to think through your attitude. And I want you to lay down some, some anchors, some ways to settle yourself, to allow God to be richer and warmer through you. And I want you to promise God that he will make you a vaccine outlet. as you hear the song.
Father, may that be our prayer, that we belong to you, may in deed and in thought, may you renovate our attitude in such a way, may what we show be the gospel of Jesus Christ, may what we say be his glory, may we, Father, be yours completely, so that we can cry, Abba, Father, thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, God, that we now have the opportunity from this point forward to have your attitude, to have your mind. Father, help us to be willing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this was a good Sunday. The, I mean, the worship was outstanding. So I just thank you guys for all that, for doing all that. We're going to be here Wednesday night. We started... Uh, a series on Christ, who he is, and um, we're going to do that probably two more Sundays before we get that all completely covered as we're moving toward Easter, and coming up is our spring fling, and so we're going to need people to help us spring and fling, and uh, and, and there's a sign-up uh, sheet out there, so if you can come help, and some of you are, you know, you're, you're more fun than others. I'm just going to say, just and, and we need you out there in the spring fling, you know? Uh, you know, like the Georges, the, you know, they're fun. It's fun. Right? It's, it's just, flat out fun. Yeah, it is fun. They come in a, in, a be, in a bug. Yeah. You know, they drive in in a bug. Yeah, the bushes. They got a lot of fun going, you know? <laughs> and, and so there's some of you that we just absolutely need out, uh, out there. The rest of you We're grouches. All fun, Steve. Yeah, I know. Everybody's fun. The rest of you grouches, <laughs> come out and help us, you know? Um, it, it, you know, we, we'll use you any way we can, and it's a great time for us to reach out to our community and see kids come and, and uh, have fun. And, and you know, there ought, to be, there ought to be a lot of celebration in Easter. Really looking forward to this season as it comes and be praying for us as we prepare for it uh, that we'll make it a glory to God and have a, just a wonderful time. So those are the big announcements, and Donna, you have one? I do. I knew you always do. <laughs> I never know what it is. Always is a strong word. Yes, it is. There's a little card over for the women, ladies of the church. Please take one of these. It's a shower because we're going to have a little baby Samuel in a few months. And so the first thing you'll do is you'll pick this up and you'll say, and how did you say that last name? And I'll tell you, Gilbert and Marcia. Javi Ambari are having a baby Samuel. And so I've asked for this, and Heather says I can. If, when we have this lunch, it'll be a women's luncheon right after church. If we can sweep out the building, even if it just has a cover, we're going to do it in the new building as the first thing. If not, we'll be in the. Right. In the if it's building. against it's the law. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> And her, yeah. her registry is right on here, but I hope everybody knew. It's May 1st. That's it. How many of you remember the last name now? Anybody want to try it? <laughs> Javi Ambari. Javi Ambari. It sounds like fun, doesn't it? Is that wrong? It? <laughs> it is right. Yeah. So when, when baby comes... Sounds like a chocolate coming out of a chocolate factory. Yeah, when we Ooh, have Samuel and Mia in the nursery, we're up 2,000%. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mia's in their nursery yeah, today, so today. don't miss seeing Mia. And uh, it's my joy to always see little Charlie. Uh, uh, that Charlie. Yeah, he, he thinks I'm an aqua superhuman <laughs> because there's Stephen the Aquaman. So don't anybody... Tell him different. Tell him different. <laughs> All right. Have a great, great day. Uh, it's, it's just a great day to be outside. It's a great day to love God. It's a great day to have great attitude. So go with a wonderful, wonderful, rich attitude.
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood